during the time that I didn't make films, when I refused to make films, um, I was reasonably content that I was making the right decisions. When the time comes to say, now I'm going to come back and make a film, that decision to say, yes, I'm going to make this film, is a much harder one. I was never confident. Um, I think if you'd asked me a question about filmmaking, uh, whether I like it, I would have given you the same answer after my first film. Um, I just at that time hadn't done as many things wrong as I've done now. Um, so there's, there's the confidence of innocence or ignorance. Good evening. How nice to see Dick Lester making a comeback after four years without a film to his name. And not a bad comeback either because his latest picture, The Three Musketeers, is of course next Monday's royal film. We'll be seeing more of Mr. Lester and his musketeers later on. But right now, and while I'm still feeling comparatively fresh, I'd like to deal with John Borman's new science fiction epic, Zardos. Now, I want you to listen very carefully while I give a rundown of the plot, because I'm not going to repeat any of this. It's set in the year 2293 and concerns a group of people called the Eternals, who've discovered the trick of eternal life and are beginning to wonder whether it was such a good idea in the first place. They live in the Vortex, a paradise sealed off from the rest of the world, which is a polluted wasteland occupied by the Brutals. Now, the Brutals, whose only function is to grow food for the Eternals, are kept in check by a privileged group from within their own tribal system called the Exterminators. Are you with me so far? Right. Well, the only contact between the Eternals in their Vortex and the Brutals in the Outlands is by means of the god Zardos, a sort of flying head that looks like a Mount Rushmore carving and collects food from the Brutals while also scaring the life out of them. It gives them little morsels of philosophy to chew on, such as the gun is good, the penis is evil. When you consider the fuss that's made about the showing of sex films and the comparatively little fuss over the showing of violent films, you may think there are people who believe that even today. However, one of the exterminators, Zed, played by Sean Connery, penetrates into Zardos and into the vortex itself. Sarah Kesselman, as one of the leaders of the Eternals, becomes his protectress, partly because she's fascinated by Connery's breeding potential, as I'm sure many girls have been. Here he is remembering the events that led... What the film is concerned with is the dramatic effect of this non-eternal and in many ways superior being on the bored, languid and even desperate world within the vortex. It's an extremely complicated picture, beautifully photographed by Geoffrey Unsworth, and you can read into it almost anything you like, fantasy, satire, a morality play, or a parable about modern life. It could be any or all of these things. In many ways, it's like The Wizard of Oz, reworked for grown-ups. But whatever you see in it, it's a fascinating and highly original work. Well, before I talk to John Borman, the producer, director and writer, let's see Zed in action in the vortex as events move towards a somewhat explosive climax. You have penetrated me. There's no escape. You are within me. Come to my center. Come into the center of the crystal. the floor in the crystal. We are gone. John Borman, welcome. Um, the first thing one would like to know is what you would like people to read into this film. Well, it is uh, paradoxical, I think, the film, and um, deliberately so, because it de deals with, I'm trying to deal with some rather serious issues about the future. And uh, particularly, I think, uh, man's relationship with the natural order. Uh, but um, I deal with serious issues, sometimes in a rather f funny, even frivolous way, in the picture. 
it's the form it takes is really of a, uh, an adventure story uh, that uh, is even really in the form of an old myth mm. and yet set into the future so that there's a kind of uh, contrast there's a between the past and the future they're both they exist side by side time is a kind of uh, wild wall you know in the film which uh, you take out and look into mm. uh, but I think that um, apart from uh, the I, I see it as a kind of entertainment, which is uh, uh, which is a very highly visual entertainment. I take I want to take audiences into another world, an invented world, which I think is always a release. Really, it always l allows us to look at ourselves in a, another way. Uh, but I think that the, the kind of central issue for me really is this question of uh, uh, how we relate to the natural world, and uh, because you see, I think in this century the whole of the century, we've ha the idea that science would conquer nature mm. has held sway. And I think this idea is now in ruins. We've come to realize this is not the case. I don't think scientists probably ever felt that, but we did. And we thought, well, disease and so on would be conquered, and uh, we'd find ways of solving all our problems. And this is now we see won't happen. And we're having to rethink our position in a ra more humble way. I think uh, this is particularly true in America, I think, where the arrogance of uh, American plundering the soil and so on has, uh, uh, has gone forever. And uh, this, is, this is really what the film is, 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 is really about. It's an it's exploration <coughs> into the future. It's a speculation about where these things are leading us. Well, it's what happens, in, in effect, when the te technological age and the system has collapsed. Yes, and to find a new way yeah. of relating, a new, way of <coughs> a, new, a new method of living. Where did you get your inspiration from? And uh, I think the Wizard of well, Oz. Uh, yes. Yes. And and there's something about uh, a touch of the medieval legends with their quest for some kind of a yes. holy grail. That, that's in there too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. I mean, that's the form that the film takes. That's the form the story takes is of a of a quest. Mm. It's in that uh, it's in that classic tradition. Uh, he's searching for some kind of truth, which is what the, all the uh, the quest stories are about. Uh, and uh, he finds it in a kind of way. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, where, where, but how I came to, to do it is really uh, uh, because I suppose, like most other people, you know, I'm very concerned about the future. I mean, it's clutching us at the throat, isn't it? It is. But this, this is a very ambitious way to project a story, a parable, mm. if you like, mm. a, a, about the future. Um, did it evolve as you went along, or, or was it thoroughly worked out in your head before you started? Well, um, I went through various versions. The first thing I did was to invent this world. Uh, I wrote a story, a long story, uh, in which I gradually fleshed out this, this future world. And then I wrote a story about this world. You know, I could have written a number of stories. In fact, I did. I wrote several stories before deciding on this one. Uh, and. Uh, and it, of course, developed. I mean, well, the whole process of making a film is a process of development. I mean, the, the idea that uh, you know a film is written and then put onto film yeah. is obviously uh, nonsense, and uh, it, it changed in all kinds of ways. Uh, but um, I, I, it's surprisingly close, I think, to to my final script that I wrote before. There's a there's a great preoccupation with with death in it, and this is not unusual in your films, is it? De death is a subject that seems to recur. I mean, Deliverance obviously was very much about death. Is is it? I mean, wh what is your fascination with that subject? Well, I find it a very interesting subject. Well, it's going to come to us all, subject. obviously. But yes, uh, yes. I mean, you know, as someone said, the only thing you can be sure of is is uh, death and taxes. You know, and uh, I I I think that it's it's one of the things which has been become a taboo. It's been it's something that people don't talk about, and I think they're less less happy for it. You know, I think that the the uh, what um, a very proper way of spending one's life is in the contemplation of death. It's an interesting theory. That I mean, I'd, I'm interested in how people die, for instance. You know, I mean, I I, I feel deprived that I uh, haven't witnessed uh, enough death. You know, and I think this is fearful. Makes people fearful of death because uh, I mean, of dying. I mean, death, of course, is the unknown, but dying is also unknown to us, whereas uh, it shouldn't be, because there's plenty of it about. Well, yes, indeed, but, but the idea that you, you put forward in, in the, the film, that death, when death is no longer attainable, it becomes utterly desirable, it's, it's quite, quite an interesting thought. 
Well, I, I show these people have eternal life, and it sours on them, uh, and they crave for death. Now, uh, I think that we are structured, we're dynamic creatures, in that sense. That in that sense, that's how we belong to nature, uh, into the natural order, and that um, uh, there's no way that we can enjoy life except within the context of, of, of dying and, 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 and regeneration. I mean, these people don't have any children because there's no point. If mm. you, once you've achieved eternal life, and I think children are quite a good thing, <laughs> having four myself. But uh, uh, so, you know, this is, this is what I'm saying, really, is that, is, is that you can live much more fully and richer and, and with more vitality if, if, you, if you are aware of your own death. I mean, we all live as though we're immortal. Yes, we do. Don't yes. we? I mean, yes. Yeah. And this is quite a recent thing. I mean, most earlier civilizations and societies, have, 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 uh, death has played a very prominent part mm. in, in, in life. There are constant reminders of it. Yeah. So well, we've I'm pushed it back a bit, haven't we? I mean, it's yeah, it's we have. We've pushed it away altogether. Yeah. But I think that, you know, people say that uh, well, death is a thing. You know, don't, don't talk about it, let alone put it in a film, you know, expect people to go and see it. But I don't think that's true. I think, I think uh, people are as fascinated as I am with the, with the whole question. One, one last point. Um, a, did you have difficulty in getting the money to make a, a film like this? And B, what was the reaction when 20th Century Fox saw what you'd given them? Well, I think that, first of all, uh, it was... The, I think that the money was given to me as a kind of act of faith because I don't think that they really understood what I was doing, which was one of the problems of making the film. When you're inventing a new world, uh, which is totally alien. It's very difficult to communicate it, except as I've done so on film. And uh, they were they, an act of faith. And so when they saw it, realized, I think they were, they were, they were very delighted that, uh, that it was on film. These uh, strange ideas actually turned into a, a film that you could see and enjoy. Well, I saw it, and I enjoyed it, and uh, I hope you have a great success with it. Thank John you. John Bullman, thank uh -huh. you very much indeed. And now, what about The Three Musketeers? This is a subject that's been fascinating movie makers since 1911 when Thomas Edison himself made a version of it. Goodness knows what that was like, but it started a trend that never seems to die. I don't think anyone knows exactly how many times the story's been filmed in Europe and America. But I suppose the most famous version so far is the silent film in 1921 that starred Douglas Fairbanks Sr., although for contractual reasons, alas, I can't show you any of that. But let's see who you can recognize from these other earlier versions. Now, my lady, where's that letter you filched from me? Take it if you dare. What are we going to do? Maybe if we got some pepper and made her sneeze. Uh, how would it be if we sort of closed our eyes and no, gave out... No, no, I know what you're thinking about, but that's not the proper solution. After all, we're musketeers and gentlemen. Nevertheless, I must have that letter. Well, we'll get it for you. All right, but remember the code. You'll do nothing undignified. Oh, don't worry ahead about that. <laughs> What's the horses? Why, we'll, well, my lovely <laughs> Hold it, hold it. Oh, oh Blackguard, see, quiet. Oh, I burn with love for you. Meet me in the summer house at midnight. It's the wrong note. Try it again. Unhand me. Blackguard, see. Hold it, oh. hold it. Wonderful you, my lips still tingle with your kisses. Meet me under the apple tree. She's a walking post office. I know, but <laughs> try it again. Oh, uh, I'm hammy, villains. What? The stars above me. <laughs> Hold it. This is it. At ease, my lady. At ease. At ease. Let's go. Alouette, petite alouette. Alouette, je te plumerai. Je te plumerai la queue. Je te plumerai la tête, alouette, 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 petite alouette. Hey, attention là, vous pourriez faire mal à quelqu'un, monsieur Poussicat. Poussicat, au secours, au secours, le Poussicat, le Poussicat, au secours du Poussicat. Bonjour, monsieur Poussicat.
Well, there we had The Singing Musketeer, starring Don Amici and the Ritz Brothers, and Gene Kelly as a rather more orthodox D'Artagnan, based on the grinning acrobatic prototype created by Doug Fairbanks, and, of course, the cut-priced two Musketeers with the incomparable Oscar-winning Tom and Jerry. I'm not altogether sure that isn't my favourite. The contemporary version of the story was made in Spain last year at a cost of $50,000 a day. The new stars include Michael York as D'Artagnan, Oliver Reed as one of the Musketeers, and in the all-star supporting cast are Charlton Heston as Richelieu, Jean-Pierre Cassel as the King, and Faye Dunaway, Raquel Welch, and Spike Milligan. Spike Milligan? The uh, original idea, apparently, was for the Beatles to play the Musketeers, and at first the director was to be either Roman Polanski or Tony Richardson. Well, you know how it is. Things don't quite work out sometimes the way they should. And in the end, Richard Lester got the job. Okay. Uh, the only thing that worries me slightly from here is the groups of them, the actual groups of the Musketeers getting their presence. The producers of the film are a couple of whiz kids in their early 20s named Pierre Spengler and Ilya Salkind. On location in Spain, Salkind explained why they'd chosen Dick Lester. Three, combi three combined styles from, from our point of view, which was Petulia, which was a very formal, dramatic, serious picture, the knack, which was absolutely hysterically funny and the forum which was full of action and fights and all kind of things so all this together is the musketeers i mean that's what we wanted to do and sticking close to dumas action jean pierre take some food and give it to the dog take some food go to eat it and then give it to the dog now the musketeers are saluting you from here Can I have the same again, Jean-Pierre? We're now there. I think Dick Lester is a, is a most famous director for funny people. <laughs> and it's a great pleasure to work with him. He shows many things and you, you try to, to do exactly like he, like he does. I think he, he loves actors and, uh, and when, uh, when he has an actor in a film, that's because he loves him, I think, I'm sure. <laughs> Richard has a marvellous sense of humour, which not everybody has. He has his own particular sense of humour as well, of course, like every individual person has. He is very easy to work for because he's very good at explaining things very quickly and very rapidly. He doesn't take too long over his explanations. He can do it like that. And also because he, he has a light-hearted approach to life. He is an amusing man. He is a light-hearted person. And therefore, obviously, working... Um, with a director like this makes everything seem slightly easier and more more amusing and more agreeable for all of us who are working in the picture no matter how tough it may be uh, he never asks you to do the impossible nearly but not quite smiling and freeze it <coughs> sleep straight at camera with think of nothing nothing go blind I think Dumas is so, the book itself is so marvelous and has so much I think more in it than I thought it had and I think was a, was available in all the other versions um, that it suddenly seemed to be a marvelous combination of of a lot that I think is exciting about films in other words, its filming possibilities are enormous. That it, that it has comedy, reasonable chance for observation about a certain uh, way of living in the 17th century. Um, even 
kind of political awareness. Uh, I'm not making any attempts to do parallels between this and Northern Ireland, uh, uh, or saying that, that Richelieu was just, just de Gaulle in drag. Um, it's, but, it, but there are very interesting things about it. Dumas really, I think, didn't like some of the musketeers very much. I mean, and and I, I, I think to have a great sweeping adventure where you have a chance to look rather coldly at the heroes and rather warmly at the villains is always pleasant. Um, there seemed to be an enormous amount of cinema in it. And I thought that for me, having not made a film for some time, it would be very useful to come back and make a film of cinema. Uh, a film which had the sweep, the adventure, the excitement, the comedy, and all the things that, that cinema needs. You know, in a film where most of the people are involved in court life, it's hard to show that they were also very dirty, that their hair, hair, although it was very carefully curled, hadn't been washed in a year, and that the dresses, you know, you know, weren't washed, they were just unpicked and beaten with a few times with a stick and then stitched back up together. Um, it's always difficult in a film, in, in some way in all this color and splendor, to show the real despair and degradation in the 17th century. I mean, for example, you, all the, the women of court relieved themselves in their own dresses. Now, that's rather hard to show on film. I mean, you can perhaps produce it by a sound effect, but we'd prefer not to. It's not easy to show that although these beautiful tapestries were on the walls, there was piles of human excrement beneath them. And that the reason that the people had so many palaces is because when, the, when one smelled so much they couldn't take it, they moved off to the other palace and let people come in and clean it. Uh, but one's trying to do that. But in a way, I have a feeling it will get lost in, in, the, in the color of it all. We keep putting bits of nastiness down on the streets, but I think that your eye will go to, to you know, the, the close-ups of your favorite star's faces. Musketeers to make this kind of great cinema epic adventure, it is not wrong to have stars. Of course, you can make it with unknown people, uh, and it will be, it, it may be a lovely film. But there's a this is a sort of fantasy. It's a larger than, than life um, extravaganza, and therefore, what's wrong with having Charlton Heston as Cardinal Richelieu? He knows a great deal about Cardinal Richelieu. He he's worked terribly hard to produce the voice, the image, the face. He studied more about Richelieu than I did. He was He's very serious. He's a marvelously capable professional actor, a charming man. Um, and, and he adds that stature to the part of Richelieu. You mean he slipped through your fingers? Slipped through your eminence's fingers. I had no orders. What happened? The woman Bonancieux took Buckingham to the palace. The woman Bonancieux? I thought I told you to arrest her, to hold her. I failed. One does occasionally. If I blundered as you do, my head would fall. I would say from a greater height than mine, Eminence. You would? The height of vaulting ambition. You have none? No. Do you fear me, Rochefort? Yes, I fear you, Eminence. I also hate you. I love you, my son, even when you fail.
As I said earlier, this new version of The Three Musketeers has been chosen for the Royal Film Performance next Monday. Whether it's worthy of such a distinction is a question that we'll have to wait till another day. Although the royal family can at least console themselves with the thought that it's just got to be better than last year's offering. For the moment, however, I'll leave you with Don Amici and the Ritz brothers. If you hear a strange whirring noise beneath your feet, don't worry. It's only Alexandre Dumas spinning in his grave. Good night. We're King's Musketeers on parade. Comrades strong, we're marching along. We're King's Musketeers on the parade. Fighting at the drop of a hat. It's to fate, it's to chance, it's to life and romance. It's one for all and it's all for one and it's me for the prince. We're King's Musketeers, so beware. If we live or we die, who's to care? Sail a V, sail a moon, sail a gay. We're musketeers. to donate a new library to the school. You stop the dance, I'll stop the library. Good evening. Now that's what I call nostalgia. Bill Haley and his comets rocking and rolling and razzling and dazzling just the way they did in the mid-1950s. But as we'll see a little later on, things don't have to be 20 years old to evoke wistful sighs of remembrance and misty-eyed reminiscences of the good old days. In this supersonic age, nostalgia starts right here, this very minute. And in a little while, Bill Haley himself, the grand old man of rock and roll, will be in the studio to talk about this phenomenon. Meanwhile, let's get on with the new crop of films before they too age before our very eyes and transform themselves into instant nostalgia. And to get the show on the road, we have West World, which is a cautionary tale, a fantasy about the future set in the present. It concerns Delos, a holiday resort, where for $1,000 a day, visitors can act out their own fantasies in three reconstructed worlds, Roman world, medieval world, and West world. Each of these worlds is inhabited by utterly lifelike male and female robots who will do anything, and I mean anything, for the guests. Well, rather than have me tell you about it, here's a word from our sponsor. At Dallas, you get your choice of the vacation you want. There's medieval world, Roman world, and of course, West world. Let's talk to some of the people who've been there. Pardon me, sir. What is your name? Uh, Gardner Lewis. Just got back from Westworld. Tell us how you liked it, Mr. Lewis. When you played cowboys and Indians as a kid, you'd point your fingers and go bang, bang, and the other kid would lie down and pretend dead. Well, Westworld is the same thing, only it's for real. I, I shot six people. Well, uh, they weren't real people. What Mr. Lewis means is he shot six robots, scientifically programmed to look, act, talk, and even bleed, just like humans do. Now, isn't that right? Well, they may have been robots. I mean, uh, 
I think they were robots. At le- I mean, I, I know they were robots. Yes, the robots of Westworld are there to serve you and to give you the most unique vacation experience of your life. Thank you, sir. Our story deals with the adventures of Richard Benjamin and James Brolin when they themselves go to Westworld and, apart from whooping it up with lady robots in the boardy house, have a daily shootout with a villainous Yulbrina robot. All goes splendidly until the day the machinery breaks down, the robots go on the rampage, and Richard Benjamin finds himself in the unenviable position of being the only human left alive with a murderous and apparently indestructible Brinner trying to gun him down. It's a really enjoyable picture, conceived and directed by Michael Crichton, who gave us an earlier cautionary tale with the Andromeda strain. The message in Westworld, of course, is that we'd better keep a very suspicious eye on all that technology around us. As an example, though, of what Westworld was like before the robots took over, let's see Mr. Benjamin's first showdown with Brynner in the local saloon. There's no way to get hurt here. Just enjoy yourself. (coughs) What is this stuff? It doesn't say. God! Give me this. Puts hair on your chest. Yeah. Slap it with your drink. Give this boy a bib. Go on. He needs his mama. Talk too much. You say something, boy. I said you talk too much. Why don't you make me shut up? The first thing I have to tell you about Papillon is that it's a very long film, two and a half hours and an intermission. And the second thing worth recording is that it's a very old-fashioned film. I doubt whether it would even have been made had it not been based on Papillon's best-selling autobiography, which tells how he was sent to Devil's Island as an alleged murderer and finally escaped. If Franklin Schaffner, the director, had taken it to Warner Brothers as an original film script, I'm sure someone would have said, nice try, Frank baby, but we stopped making this kind of movie ten years ago. It's an earnest and solemn attempt to show how beastly life must have been on Devil's Island and how difficult it was to slip away unnoticed, but I found it unconvincing. The scene is set when Papillon, played by Steve McQueen, and his friend Degas, the wealthy forger, played by Dustin Hoffman, arrive at the penal colony and try to bribe their way into positions of privilege. Make the best of what we offer you, and you will suffer less than you deserve. Dismissed. Dagar. Oh, yes, indeed. I know all about you, Mr. Dagar. 
Very intelligent man. Thank you. I, uh, I seem to be known in all the wrong places. Well, I have a friend who is a guard. A very... Yes, go ahead. For very little money, he can arrange for certain people to stay here instead of being sent to a work camp on the islands. Can you get us a job here so we can walk around the place? Perhaps a selection from which we may choose? Oh, yes. And that is my friend camp. If you take our money, and you put your life on the line. Oh, of course. How much will it cost? Well, now, my friend has a very large family. Many little children, you understand? And his sergeant has a mother heart. He was asking you how much, not how many. If you don't mind, I'll do the negotiating. How much? For you, 500. For him, 1,500. He made trouble. Yes, indeed he did. Nevertheless, I'll give you 1250 for the both of us. Now, you take it or leave it as you wish. shoes for both of us. And you, you get the 2,000. Don't you have to go to the toilet? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, of course. Will you excuse me a moment? Oh, you don't need to, Mr. Degas. Unless, of course, you want to. I can pick it up in the morning. It's a predictable and uninspired film. Dustin Hoffman is there, presumably, for comic relief, which seems to be a mistake, because if you're trying to show how awful a place is, you don't really want comic relief. And Steve McQueen lends to the role of Papillon his full repertoire of several expressions. This clip shows one of the many attempts at escape when Papillon and friends are aided by a tattooed and more or less unexplained helper. You like this? Oh, very much. I did too at the time, but I was drunk. <laughs> here, take this. Cut yourself some bamboo from around here. Lash it together with sailcloth. I'll be back around sunset. I'll tow you up river to Pigeon Island. You can get a boat there if you got enough money. If you haven't got enough money, they'll probably kill you. Doesn't matter much to them either way. They're all lepers. Blooming Love is the tale of a Californian divorce lawyer, Stephen Bloom, played by George Siegel, who doesn't realize how much he loves his wife until she discovers him in bed with his gorgeous black secretary. He protests, as any man would, that he's merely brought his work home with him, but his wife leaves him nevertheless. Most of the story is told in flashback as Bloom wanders around St. Mark's Square in Venice, where he'd spent his honeymoon six years earlier, and recalls nostalgically, to bring us back to the original theme of this program, how he'd tried to forget his wife by having affairs with various people, and how she'd taken up with Chris Christopherson, a pot-smoking pop singer, and how eventually the three of them, Bloom, pop singer and wife, had become good friends. This is Bloom remembering earlier and happier days in St Mark's Square. And we 
fed the pigeons. Then our honeymoon was over. Now, whether all this moves or amuses you depends very much on whether or not you fancy Susan Ansbach, who plays Bloom's wife. I know it's very unchivalrous of me, but I didn't fancy her very much at all. I don't suppose she'll lose a moment's sleep over this, but if I were married to the kind of woman she plays here, a thin, intense, slightly neurotic American, all bones and teeth, I'd be so grateful to her for leaving me that I'd positively insist on being best man when she got married again. But there you are, one man's mate is another man's poison. George Siegel's very good, and so in a cameo role is Shelley Winters, and if you can imagine yourself mooning heartbrokenly over Miss Ansbach, then I expect Bloom in Love has everything, or nearly everything. This is the scene when Siegel delivers a begging letter to his wife and meets Mr. Christofferson for the first time. Now you Just leave me alone. Just read the letter. A lot of emotion gets kind of weary. I'm not weary. I am. You want a cigarette? I got my own. What do you do now? Go to your office? Why? I don't know. What do you do now? Go home and roll joint. Are you in love with Nina? What does that mean? Do you love her? She makes me feel good. I make her feel good, is that love? Does she smoke a lot of grass? What's a lot? You're some cute guy. You ain't no day at the beach. At this point, we'd hoped to show a scene from a new and much applauded American film, Mean Streets. It should have opened at the Academy Cinema, but it's been held back because of the success of Summer Wishes Winter Dreams, which stars Joanne Woodward. We've not actually dealt with Summer Wishes Winter Dreams on this program yet, so let's make good that omission now. Essentially, it's a vehicle for one of those portraits of confused, unfulfilled, middle-aged American womanhood that Miss Woodward does so well. In this case, she plays a middle-class New Yorker with plenty of money and plenty of problems, among them a homosexual son and an inability to show any kind of love. And again, there's the element of nostalgia, as she constantly thinks back to the happier and less complicated days of her childhood. It's what used to be known as a star vehicle, and happily the star is more than able to cope. Miss Woodward gives a performance that's sensitive, delicate and totally believable, and she's rightly been nominated for an Oscar as Best Actress. Sylvia Sidney, who plays her mother, has also been nominated as Best Supporting Actress. And if there were any justice, Martin Balsam, who plays Miss Woodward's husband, would have had a third nomination for himself. But alas, he got overlooked. However, this clip from the beginning of the film gives a taste of all three of them. out of my mind that they're painting a living room. It ought to be blue. A very soft Wedgwood blue. Uh, what about lunch? I thought instead of eating at my hotel, we ought to meet somewhere near the theater. Have you got cue? Well, I thought we could look in the restaurant section together. We want the village, right? You like Indian? There's an Indian curry place someone told me was marvelous. Uh, around 11th Street, I think. Anyhow, I don't think I want all that spicy stuff. I stopped for tea and the worst brand muffin I ever had in my life. I told the waitress, what do you use this thing for? A window display? <laughs> Did you ever hear of such a thing? What about Daniels? What do you think? Any place I'm not freezing, I don't care. 
Well, you better start caring before I run out of change. Do you want my number here? If I can read the damn thing. You want to think about it and call me back? Or what? Rita! Well, now I'm blind. Is that better or worse or the same? I can't see anything. It's just a smear. All right. Now, what happens? What happens when I add this? Is that clearer? Read the fourth line. Harry, would you not brush your finger against my face? Oh, please? am I? Well, every time you change the lens. Well, it just gives me support. That's all. I mean, that, does it really bother you? Well, either touch me or don't touch me. No, it's very irritating. All right, read the fourth line, please. F. C, B, D. All right, let's try this one. No. Sorry. Better? Worse or the same? No, that's worse. That's worse or better. I can't tell the difference anymore. Harry, I don't want to have a tumor of the brain. What the hell are you talking about a tumor? Do you know what your trouble is? You don't have enough to occupy your brain, so you put a tumor there to fill up the space. I'm unoccupied. Yes. Oh, you're certainly right. Do you know what I have to do between now and 1.30? Yes. I have to babysit for Anna. I have to take the children from the Fowling home to Central Park, and then I have to meet my mother for lunch. That really is unoccupied. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did I say you don't rush around? It's just silly, that's all. You don't get enough sleep. You wake up exhausted. By the time I get home, it's just too much goddamn trouble to even say hello. I didn't come here to argue. Did you get any sleep last night? People with unoccupied brains don't need sleep. <laughs> Yeah, how's this? This is that clear? Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, nothing to worry about, sweetheart. Just a little change of focus, a little far side in this all of a sudden. That's all. Small potatoes. I'll prescribe some reading glasses and then you can get yourself some Harlequin frames. Harlequin frames? We've been married how long? And so to nostalgia. American graffiti looks back longingly to the dim, dead, distant past of 1962. And that really is bringing nostalgia a bit close to home. It's rather like you thinking back to that far gone golden age when I said good evening about 20 minutes ago. Still, American graffiti is quite a lot of fun. It was produced by Francis Ford Coppola, who made The Godfather, and directed by George Lucas, who's won an Academy Award nomination. It deals with one night in the lives of a group of teenagers in Northern California, the nights before a couple of them are due to leave for university, and they drive around town looking for adventure. Apart from quite a lot of good rock music, there's not much more to it than that, but it's pleasant and charming and very nicely acted. Here now is one of the capers the kids get up to. You've got just two seconds to get your ass over in your corner. Don't worry, I won't rape you. Hey, you got a bitchin' car. In fact, your car's so neat, we're going to give you our special prize. You want me to give it to you? Hey, sweetheart, if the prize is you, I'm a ready tit. Well, get bent, turkey. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Very funny. I'm delighted to welcome Bill Haley, who was certainly one of the earlier exponents of rock and roll, even if he didn't actually invent it. Bill, 1962, is, is that a year you look back to with any particular nostalgia? Not really, Barry. It's, uh, our nostalgia would have to go back, I think, to 1951, to 1954, 1955. 
would be the uh, that was the beginning for us you know the is, is, is that we've been having a, an argument around here about when rock and roll actually started and and what the peak years were and 51 was the beginning of it all was it well it actually started uh, the real birth of it was 1949 uh, 1950 and 51 these were the years when we were struggling to get it started with the uh, radio stations and to have it recognized of course uh, 1952 1953 were our first big million selling records and, uh, and the public in general knows it from 1954 on because of the film Blackboard Jungle and uh, the uh, record rock around the clock and of course, yeah, well, that's, that's it because I associate rock and roll actually beginning with that record no, it actually started in 1949. It, uh, the big worldwide, uh, uh, the general, the popular opinion, as, as you say, is, was 1955 or 56. Because then, of course, we had the movie Rock Around the Clock, and this was our first tour of Great Britain, was in 1957. But actually, the true part of it, it started uh, the, the initial years, the birth years, were 1951, 1952, and 1953. Now, what happened though, in, in the 60s when the groups like the Beatles and the Stones came along? Did that hit you very hard at all? Well, no. I'd, actually, Barry was a great boost to us because we had... Uh, uh, I had carried it for a number of years, then Elvis Presley carried it, Chubby Checker carried it, and we... Uh, I think we were all a little travel-worn about this time, and then yeah. uh, luckily the Beatles came along about this time, and they gave a big boost to the music, which helped us very much. But you carried on. I mean, you, you didn't go into oh, oblivion yeah. or no, vanish no, no, from something. No, no. This, uh, luckily, the music was so, was so big, so gigantic over the years. There was always room for the, for the uh, Jerry Lee Lewis's and the Bill Haley's and the Chuck Berry's to continue playing around the world, different places. Did you ever change your style, or wouldn't the fans let you? No, we have never changed, and uh, uh, you were right on both counts. They wouldn't let us. Yeah. They, they wouldn't hear of it. They wanted the. Uh, they wanted it exactly the way it was originally, and they still do today. But would you like to to try something else, no, to play a different kind no, of music? No, no, Barry, I wouldn't. A lot of people ask us that, and the, the logical answer is yes, but uh, actually we wouldn't because there's so much uh, enthousi enthusiasm with the audiences, and uh, they, they enjoy it so much that it's contagious, and we get the same feeling. And strangely enough, after 20 years of it, it's, uh, it's just as invigorating for me it was last night as it will be tomorrow night, you know, so... Uh, we're very happy with it. But, you know, if, if, you, if you had a dollar for every time you've played Rock Around the Clock, you'd be able to retire quite happily, wouldn't you? <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. yeah. We've certainly done it enough in the last... Uh, it'll be 20 years, the 12th of April this month, by the way. Oh, well, happy birthday. Yeah. Um, this nostalgia thing that we've got here, I, I suspect it, it, it's the same in America, isn't it? Because if suddenly everybody's looking back um, to the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, now even to the 60s. Is, it's, it's like that in the States, huh? Well, of course. It's, it's, uh, well, I shouldn't say, of course. It, it has been that way now since 19... Uh, we first noticed it, Barry, in 1966, and it started in France and uh, uh, in Holland. Mm. 1968, there was uh, a so-called big rock revival in England, and uh, I think they kind of uh, rushed it just a bit. It didn't quite happen then, but... Uh, 1969, it started uh, all over the United States, and uh, it just kept spreading. And here, actually, the 1968 rock and roll revival is now happening in England in 1974. <laughs> so. And you're playing now, of course, to audiences who weren't even conceived when you first started playing Rock Around the Clock, for instance. Well, that's true, and we have a uh, complete new generation, and thank goodness they're, uh, they're rediscovering Bill Haley and the Comets, and that makes us very happy, too, you know. And, but do, do they turn up still, people, in, in the teddy boy gear that they used to wear originally? Oh, yes, yes. We have, uh, we have quite a few of them that turn up everywhere we go, and uh, we're very happy that they do. And we now have a, a, a happy medium of uh, our fans from the 1950s and our, uh, our fans from the 1960s and now the new fans of the 70s. So it makes for quite an interesting evening any time you come to see us. Oh, I bet it does. Well, Bill Haley, long may it continue. Thank you, Barry. My pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Well, next week the Oscars will be awarded and on Film 74 I'll be looking at the five nominees for the title of Best Actor and trying to decide what, if anything, makes them special. Until then, let's play ourselves out with another piece of nostalgia. Good night.
Basically, most particularly in view of some of the nasty reviews, I don't think, I'd love to do it again, but I don't think in the end I'd probably change anything. I might try different ways of doing it. In the end, I might come right back to this. Good evening. Director Jack Clayton reacting to the unkind American reviews of The Great Gatsby. And after all the ballyhoo, I don't suppose I'll have to tell you what The Great Gatsby is about. If you've been paying close attention to the pre-publicity, you'll know it's about wearing white suits and correspondent shoes and 1920s dresses and having a hair cut short. And you may even be vaguely aware that it has some connection with rather a good book. Still, we'll get to that a little later when I'll be talking to Jack Clayton about his film. And Frederick Raphael, novelist and Oscar-winning scriptwriter, will be in the studio to discuss the problems of transferring a great novel to the cinema. But first, let's look at Sidney Lumet's latest film, Serpico which is based on the true story of a New York cop, Frank Serpico, who bravely but misguidedly set out to expose the corruption, graft and bribery in the police force and received very little for his pains except disillusionment and a bullet in the face. Serpico is an idealist and an honest man, two qualities which obviously made him highly unsuited to be a New York policeman. The film tells the story of his 11-year fight against corruption in flashback, taking time off now and then to sketch in his home life and his love life. It's an appalling story because not until he told all to the New York Times would anybody take him seriously. Frank Serpico, the son of Italian immigrants, joined the force in 1959. Being a policeman was his idea of a worthwhile job, to serve the community. In 1965, he became a plain clothesman, a step towards becoming a detective. But his altruism was shattered by the graft his fellow officers were taking. He spent years trying to get the top brass to listen and do something about it. No one did, and in 1970, totally disillusioned, he took his story to the New York Times. Serpico's revelations shook the city. On February the 3rd, 1971, Frank Serpico was shot in the head on a narcotics raid in Brooklyn. Last year, the movie became a box office success. In New York alone, it's already taken a million dollars and followed only a few months after the book by ex-reporter Peter Mass had become a bestseller. The various editions have sold around three million copies. The royalties and the film rights have made a bundle for Peter Mass. I'd given the first uh, two or three chapters to my agent, and without me knowing it, he had shown it to um, Al Pacino. He asked me if I thought Pacino would be good in the part of Serpico, and I said, sure. And then came back and said, Pacino wants to sign right away, just on reading the first chapter. And then uh, some four or five months after that, I was nearing the end of the book when uh, Pino De Laurentiis uh, also read the first chapter, and uh, just on the basis of that, he uh, he, uh, he he bought it uh, almost. In, I think in five minutes. So let me read. I read this twenty page, the first twenty page, and I must say, in this twenty page, all the character is clear, all the story to me is clear. And I call next day to Peter. I said, Peter, I read this twenty page. I want to buy. He said to me, but you are so crazy to pay to me $450,000 before you read the book. I said, I'm ready to buy the book in this 20 page. And then I make the deal. Huh? And I must say, I finished the picture now. Al Pacino is a sensation. He really is, he really is the best performance in his life. He's a great actor. My Serpico is fantastic. For the first time, I have a great story, great script, Great actor like Al Pacino, a great director like Sidney Lumet, make fantastic combination. I think I make one of the most important movies in all my life. The problem was double in this one. Uh, first of all, the first obligation of it, directorially, just from a stylistic point of view, was to um, let an audience know that it was the truth, that it is a true story. 
This week you're eight to four, next week four to midnight. Big questions, the older guys will fill you in. <laughs> Okay, who are your playmates? Hey, Frank, you want a piece of this? How come you didn't stay for the fun? That's not my kind of fun. You talk to me. Save yourself. So from every point of view, the problems were uh, ones of deep commitment to the truth of it. So that... The way that manifests itself is that, for instance, ordinarily uh, you hit a location that uh, is just about right, but let's fix this up, uh, let's change this color, let's do that. In this case, uh, don't touch a thing. If you haven't, in those 104 locations, find the right one. Uh, it was doubly compounded by the fact that the uh, story goes over 10 years, so that a lot of what is now period stuff from 1960 and 1961 doesn't even exist anymore. Um, so it was a question of finding everything, visually and in performance, on its absolutely naturalistic level, not even on its realistic level, on a naturalistic right. level. Here we go, uh... Number one, the fact that it is true uh, immediately moves it into another area. I know, um, as you say, a movie tends to be, be more fictionalized, uh, but... Um, I never bothered with it. I mean, I, I never let it be any censor, nor, nor did I try to balance out his, his heroic behavior by having him behave badly. Uh, it didn't seem necessary to me because the heroic behavior just came from such internal drive uh, as a, in the portrait of a man. I mean, that's why it's going to be a long movie because it really is, I hope, a portrait of Frank. I didn't really dwell on it. I just let it ride because what he did was so extraordinary to me anyway. Hey, Frankie, how you doing? You keep asking me that. What's the matter with you? Well, I thought you were coming over to the house. Margaret invited Marianne over. Hey, Pasquale, I'm going to tell you something. See, all day long, I work with cops, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I go out, I see Marianne. Her father's a cop. Her brother's a cop. Her uncle's a cop. I got a feeling she's a cop, too. <laughs> I must have been nine, ten years old. I was this big. All my life, I wanted to be a cop. I can remember nothing else. So what do you think, Frank, about the money? I don't know. But I'm not broke, and I don't have a family. You want to stick my neck out? It's already out, Frank. Not taking the money. Hey! Get up, get up. What the hell's going on here? Who the hell are you? Police, who the hell do you think we are? Where are you from? The borough of Manhattan, Navy. No, damn it. No, you're not from the borough. I just paid the borough this morning. We're not doing anything bad here. We're skimming a little gambling money. It's clean. If they would take all that energy, see, put it into straight police work, we'd have the city cleaned up in a week. If they clean up, there'd be no crime. The vulnerability, the mistakes, the doubts, the fears, uh, that's another thing that moves it on to a totally human level. And this is also true of Frank. Uh, he's the bravest man in the world because he's scared, uh, terrified. And uh, that playing of the fear, the physical fear, the emotional fear, uh, it's a very important part of the movie. Telling you, Captain, they came to me with 800. I can take it if I want it. Holy mother of God. It's a fuck of the worms. Well, I could. I, I could go to the commissioner. From 1965, Serpico continued to hound the police hierarchy with details of corruption. A cop could rake off $800 a month from gambling operations. Senior officers took a share and a half. In 1968, he was transferred to a narcotics division where large-scale corruption was rife. Serpico, get in. Okay, you might get by in the Bronx, but down here, 800 a month is chicken feed. Last week, one dope dealer, 120,000 split four ways. That's serious money. So as they ask you who's taking money? What I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, but you do know, Frank. Mm -hmm. Look, Frankie, I like you. I don't want to see anything happen to you. Serpico? You won't find anything on Serpico. He's clean. Serpico! See Inspector Palmer. Frank, it's very easy to um, get hurt. It takes a 14-shot clip. You expecting an army? No, just a division. We know how to handle guys like you. I had to cut your tongue out. 
Serpico was joined in his crusade by David Dirk, a cop with contacts in high places. They took their evidence to the commissioner for investigations, but they failed to get results. Their next move was to the mayor's office in April 1967. This is a rehearsal of a scene which takes place in City Hall. Dirk had become friendly with Mayor John Lindsay's personal aide, Jay Kriegel, who had special duties to advise the mayor on police affairs. But there are priorities, and they're priorities. What are the priorities? The mayor says, the mayor says that we cannot upset the cops. Upset the cops? Those are the priorities? The priority is a long, hot summer ahead. Riots are expected, and the mayor cannot alienate the entire police Frank. force. Frank! Uh, summer was coming up. Uh, it was the year after the riots, and, uh, and from his own point of view, he wasn't going to get into a uh, go to the mat with the police department uh, at what was a potentially dangerous time for the city. And that's the way it's dealt with. That's as much as it's dealt with in the, in the movie. Nothing more was heard from the mayor's office, and nearly three years later, on February the 12th, 1970, Dirk and Serpico decided to go to the press. That's a goddamn serious step, Frank. I don't know if the timing is right. Just want it on the record, you know? In case something should happen to me. This didn't go to waste. I don't know if we carry enough weight. I don't know if the New York Times would go that far out on a limb on the say-so of two flunky cops. Their man at the Times was crime reporter David Burnham, and for ten weeks, the three worked together on the story, published on April the 25th. This two-page report on the extent of corruption forced Mayor John Lindsay into appointing an independent commission. Serpico remained on active duty in the narcotics division. Throughout the picture, the physical threat to him keeps growing. Eventually, he gets shot. And I said to him, having been warned about being set up, how did you go in first that day? And he, it's the classic police response, which is at those moments you don't think. All of that goes and whack you dysfunction on instinct. And uh, his shoulder was against that door and then he went. When you talk to Frank about it, uh, his only thing that he keeps saying over and over again was that it was bound to happen, uh, that he felt it coming for a long time. And uh, after he was shot in the hospital, 75% incapacity, then he got his gold shield. The subsequent testimony of the two men who were with him at the time uh, and as Peter points out in the book they didn't tell quite the same story there were variations in that uh, and don't try to slant it in any direction uh, from the old Jack Webb thing just did the facts <laughs> and as they say in New York if you want to know the time bribe a policeman nevertheless the fuss Serpico made did cause the Knapp Commission to be set up to investigate the police and make a lot of noise and cause a few token resignations the commission hearings, in fact, became as much of a nightly television event in New York as Watergate. Through my appearance here today, I hope that police officers in the future will not experience the same frustration and anxiety that I was subjected to for the past five years at the hands of my superiors because of my attempt to report corruption. I was made to feel that I had burdened them with an unwanted task a fundamental conclusion at which the commission has arrived is that the problem of police corruption cannot, as is usually asserted, be met by seeking out the few rotten apples whose supposedly atypical conduct is claimed to sully the reputation of an otherwise innocent department. The commission is persuaded that the underlying problem is that the climate of the department is inhospitable to attempts to uncover acts of corruption and protective of those who are corrupt. The consequence is that the rookie who comes into the department is faced with a situation where it is easier for him to become corrupt than to remain honest. And on uh, that somewhat defeatist note, Serpico, thoroughly dispirited, resigned and went to live in Switzerland. The film doesn't attempt to apportion any blame or draw any positive conclusions, but it's a good workmanlike job and Al Pacino, who won an Oscar nomination for the role of Serpico, gives a most effective performance. But now let's uh, move on to The Great Gatsby, the film for which, no doubt, we've all been waiting with bated breath, the breath of some being, of course, more bated than others. 
In the event, it turns out to be a worthy, well-intentioned, honest and even honourable failure. It fails for a number of reasons, the first of which is that I don't think Scott Fitzgerald's novel is filmable at all. It's a thing of mood and atmosphere and deceptively simple but brilliant prose. It's a thing to be read and not to be photographed, because there's no way the cinema can match the pictures that Fitzgerald conjures up in the reader's mind. Secondly, I've some grave misgivings about the casting, and these I put to Jack Clayton. From the day that I met Redford, um, which is a moment when he was very kind and flew in from Cannes to meet me at the airport, and we just sat and talked for an hour, I never personally had any doubt, nor would I change it now. Robert Redford is surprisingly good and convincing as the shady, mysterious Gatsby, the man who reaches out to grasp a dream which is already behind him. But as Daisy, the object of that dream, Mia Farrow simply doesn't measure up at all. The reason for choosing Mia was purely because, for me, she is the right kind of Daisy, quite apart from being a beautiful actress. I took Mia out to lunch. As I was taking out to lunch, anybody who I thought uh, might be possible, um, but a lot of the other ladies were beautiful actresses too, but um, she's my Daisy and that's it. And again, I wouldn't change. Daisy is frivolous, vain, haughty, selfish, silly and utterly captivating. Miss Farrow is mostly fey, childlike and petulant. To be fair, it's an almost impossible role. But unfortunately, if you can't believe in Gatsby's obsession with the girl, it's hard to believe in the rest of the story. It has been said of the film that it's over-reverential, over-long and over-slow, and I think these are valid points. But they arise through the laudable efforts of both Jack Clayton and the scriptwriter, Francis Ford Coppola, to be faithful to the book. The reconstruction of the 1920s, the jazz age, the mad hell-raising decade of the lost generation, is meticulous in detail, but somehow the subtlety of the novel has gone. For example, Gatsby's romance with Daisy and even Gatsby's murder by Wilson, the garage proprietor, are reported at second hand in the book by the narrator, Nick Carraway. In the film, everything is spelt out for us and occasionally underlined. And these things too, I put to Jack Clayton. If in fact you did those without showing them, and most particularly Gatsby's death, it would be like um, in a drawing room comedy of the what, thirties, where the butler comes in and shouts through the door, oh, by the way, somebody's just died. Um, I don't think that's filmmaking. But isn't there there's some <coughs> the aspect of Greek tragedy in, in the book, with these things happening off stage and Nick merely hearing a shot at, at most? Um, is, isn't, couldn't that be equally effective? Um, no, I don't think so at all, because I think it's very important that you should see the terrible tragedy. I mean, um, I think strange, I hate to say this, but I mean it. Um, I think the film is better in a strange way in that regard than the book, um, only because you understand more of the tragedy of Wilson. Wilson is thrown away in the book, and later another body was found in the bushes, you know, having shot himself. Uh, Wilson is a terribly important character to me in the film because um, he is another of the victims. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with a big, long and somewhat hollow movie that's beautiful to look at and superbly photographed by Douglas Slocum. Also on the credit side, there are two excellent performances by Sam Waterston as Nick, the narrator, and Bruce Dern as Tom Buchanan, Daisy's unfaithful husband. But now, let's have a look at one of the best scenes in the picture, the hot afternoon in the Plaza Hotel, when Gatsby makes his bid to take Daisy away from her husband. Yeah. Mr. Gatsby, I understand that you're an Oxford man. Not exactly. No, no. I understood that you went to Oxford. I went there, yes. Mm-hmm. It was an opportunity they gave some of the officers after the armistice. Were you in the war, Mr. Buchanan? No, I wasn't in the war. I'd like to know what kind of a row it is you're trying to cause in my house. He isn't causing a row. You're causing a row. Please, have a little self-control. Self-control? Have a little self-control? I suppose the latest thing is to just sit back and relax while a Mr. Nobody from Nowhere makes love to your wife, is that it? 
Well, if that is it, Daisy, count me out. Because let me make myself clear about one thing. Nowadays, people begin by sneering at family life and family institutions. And before you know it, they'll throw all that overboard and we'll have intermarriage between black and white. We're all white here. I've got something to tell you, old sport. Oh, please don't. No, Daisy, listen. Oh, please. Let's all go home. No, no. Let's all go home, please. Nobody's going home. I'm going to sit down right here. And I'll listen to what it is that Mr. Gatsby has to tell me. Yes? Thank you. Sir. Well. Your wife doesn't love you. She's never loved you. She loves me. You must be crazy. The only reason she married you was because I was poor. And she was tired of waiting. And that was a mistake. But in her heart, she's never loved anyone except me. That's a goddamn lie. Sit down, Jordan. Nick, Daisy loved me when she married me, and she loves me now. No. And what's more, I love her now. now. I'll admit that every now and then she gets a little confused and gets involved in things she doesn't really understand. But I also have been known to go off on a spree or two in my life and make a goddamn fool of myself. But I have always come back. And in my heart, I always love her. You are revolting. Do you remember why we left Chicago? Huh? I'm surprised you don't tell the story of that little spree of yours. Nancy, just tell him the truth. Just tell him. Tell him you never loved him and it'll all be wiped out forever. All Jack Clayton's films as a director from Room at the Top to The Pumpkin Eater and The Great Gatsby have been based on successful novels and not on original screenplays. I suggested to him that this might be rather inhibiting to a filmmaker. Well, it is very much easier, um, you know, very obviously to do um, either a total original or to get one line from somewhere and write a story about it. That, I mean, that's the simple thing. On the other hand, that means that you're saying that nobody should ever make into a book, into a film, or put into another medium something which is a classic, or let's say called a classic, and I don't think that's right. Well, that seems a pretty good cue to introduce Frederick Raphael, who does write original screenplays, but who's also adapted other people's novels, notably Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd. Freddie, I have an awful confession. I didn't actually see Far From the Madding Crowd, for which I apologise. No, no. <laughs> well, it, it, it might be advantageous because you won't then take it personally when I say that I feel there's a, a law of diminishing returns when you're transferring a great novel to the screen, that the better the novel, the less chance you have of actually producing a good movie. Would you go yes, I, th I think there's some truth in that. I, I think one can distinguish, actually, between uh, books like Far From the Madding Crowd or, you might say, the limit instance of... Uh, of War and Peace, which are very long books where the problem is to extract certain key incidents and to compress, and for instance a book like Gatsby, um, where the problem is not actually one of compression since it is in fact a very short book, or quite a short book. Um, the other distinction I'd make, uh, I think, is that, that when you're, obviously there are certain books that you can take, uh, like a detective story, where you simply choose certain aspects of it, in particular the plot. Uh, I mean, I was very greedy for plots since I can't think of them very well and admire detective uh, writers who can. Uh, and then you can build on that edifice without feeling too much sense of impiety when you add or subtract or put in uh, uh, quite different episodes. Uh, the better the book, obviously, the greater tendency towards piety. Uh, it seems to me, though, that the better the book, uh, the more likely something else is to happen, uh, which is that your approach to it becomes, in the best sense, critical. That yes. is, you look at it, not in, obviously in a disparaging sense, but in the sense of somebody who is very, very interested, as a literary critic is, in exactly what is going on in there. When you read a very good criticism, uh, for instance, of Gatsby, I mean, there's a paperback which has a number of essays, and a very, very interesting book it is, too, about, uh, about the great Gatsby. Uh, you read a very good critic, you see new things in the book. Now, do you think that, that that critical attitude is present in in the film of Gatsby that we've just seen? I, I enjoyed the film, uh, well, I might even say inevitably, more than I thought I was going to, because it did have this uh, marvellous kind of... People love telling you how bad the notices are of things yes. which you've uh, uh, nearly done or not done or whatever. Um, when one saw it, one thought, well, this is really rather good. But one did, I think, miss any sense of 
quirkiness in the approach to it. Mm. Uh, it it's not a question of reverence. It, it was faithful in the dullest sense of faithful. Uh, that is, it never considered infidelity. I mean, there's a form of fidelity which is not very flattering, which is one is incapable of being unfaithful. I think at this stage, perhaps I'd better let you declare yourself because you were, in fact, asked to do the script for Gatsby at one time. Well, I you? thought I was, yes, I thought I oh. was. But uh, I seemed to perish by the wayside at some point, uh, not measuring up in some way which I wasn't aware of. Um, I, I'm sorry not to have done it, uh, and I'm certainly not in any way suggesting that I would have done it uh, better, uh, nor even that one would have done it differently, because the pressures of, of the big production are so great. Uh, the desire not to go wrong is the way in which big productions go wrong. Yes. Uh, and I think this is what, what, what really happened here. I enjoyed the film a lot. I don't see any reason why, why uh, it should be disparaged. Uh, one missed any sense of alertness to nuance or discovery of nuance. And this is, I think, uh, the great lack and the great, uh, I don't say lifelessness, but the lack of specific strange perspective in it. Uh, the fact that the people in the, in the story, in fact, reflect each other and attempt to turn each other into different sorts of beings in order to suit them, which is what Gatsby does, for instance. Uh, this seemed not to be conveyed by what convey, it can best be conveyed by, which is photography, the very cinematic aspect of, of how people look. I thought that Gatsby, for instance, this is a feature which uh, I, I don't think in any way could be avoided. Once you've cast Redford, once you've elected to make Gatsby a hero, in the book it seemed to me, without stretching uh, critical terminology too far, uh, Gatsby was in long shot. Uh, constantly in long shot, and that was what was fascinating about him. There was a film which uh, was made of, uh, about Salvatore Giuliano, the, uh, the Sicilian bandit, uh, made by Italians, and in that, uh, because they weren't concerned to make a star part out of the Giuliano thing, Giuliano himself was simply a figure on the landscape, occasionally seen in White Macintosh, uh, sinister, strange, uh, a charismatic figure. Uh, and in a way, Gatsby was like this. Once you bring him into class, he has to start saying things. Well, this is where I, I thought they made a... I thought it was a great mistake to, to bring the love scenes right into the centre of the picture, and indeed to bring the murder into the centre of the picture. So much more effective if that's reported off. Yes, but the problem is that when you've got to that point, doing everything literally and correctly, you have in the end to be literal-minded at the end. You can't suddenly switch from one mode into another, and I think this was really the problem. Uh, Jack Clayton was right. It's like when you're cutting a piece of wood, you can't suddenly alter the angle of your saw. You just have to keep going, even though you wish the tree would fall in a different direction. It's sort of got to go that way, because the first cut has been made in a, in a direction which finally determines the whole angle of the slice. Well, what about the, the whole idea of, of filming books like Gatsby? Um, it, it seems to me that it's complete in itself. What, what, what's the point of putting well, it on, on uh, the cinema you, screen? The, the, I, what the point is always to make money uh, uh, and to provide a common basis for a certain number of talents to converge. See, if you take a thing like Gatsby, the, the designer, the, the, uh, the musical director, the actors, everybody, know, everybody knows of the existence of this thing, and they can all sort of zoom in on a, on a particular place. Whereas if you take something and you say, well, I've got an idea for a movie, everyone's very anxious until they've got it in their hand. The Gatsby is sort of there before you start. In fact, one wondered, and I asked uh, Jack Clayton this when, when we were talking about it, uh, why you need a writer. I mean, actually, it's all there. It's a problem of montage, not of writing. And uh, that's a very big problem, not a little one. Well, it, well, that's what you need to... Well, you need a writer for that. Come along. Yeah, yes, being you, too modest. You do, but I, I, think, I think, in a way, you need a writer who is a, a director more than you need a director who is a cameraman. Uh, yeah. That's perhaps slightly unkind. It's not meant to be unkind. It's just actually true about, about, about Jack Clayton. It seems to me that, that intellectually there's something missing in the book. It may be that of all the things we don't need in movies, it's intellectual ability. But in this instance, that critical edge not only isn't there, I don't think it ever occurred to anyone that it might be needed. No, I I've, have a feeling that, that it's a film that will appeal to people who haven't read the book much more than it will appeal to those who have. I, I, don't, I don't know about that. I mean, it, it's always fun to see it. You know, it there, again, coming back to criticism, there's, if one reads critical works, it's more fun to read reviews of things that one's seen. So in a sense, I don't think it's sort of uh, damaging one's uh, uh, enjoyment to have read it. Uh, the first part, I must say, I, I thought was very much better. In fact, until Gatsby came in, although Redford is excellent, I really thought it was very, very good. And that was quite a large slice of the picture. I really thought, what, what can they be talking about? This is excellent. It was only when you came to the heart and found that it was plastic that, that it fell apart, because there was that terrible, what can we make them do thing, which always occurs between lovers and films. You know, there isn't much lovers can do. Freddie, thank you very much indeed. And so from Film 74, that's all until next week. Good night.
Good evening. And yes, since I know you're about to ask, I did have a nice holiday. Thank you very much. And so, having dispensed with the social niceties, let's get down to business. Tonight we have, among other things, Francis Ford Coppola talking about his new film, The Conversation. Elliot Gould and Donald Sutherland talking about spies. And to begin with, our very own Anne Haywood, Violet Pretty as was in her beauty queen days, as the naughtiest nun of the 16th century. The Nun and the Devil is an Italian film directed by Paolo Dominici and based on a short story by Stendhal and various 16th century legends about some very steamy goings on in a convent in which the occupants only clean habits are the ones they wear. It's rather like a depraved girls school with Miss Haywood as a prefect who attempts through fair means or foul and mostly foul to become head girl. She gets a flying start on most of her rivals by slowly poisoning the mother superior and also by procuring her own niece for one of her supporters, a wealthy nobleman. Understandably, the church takes a close interest in all this, partly because it doesn't much approve of its mother superior being poisoned and partly because all the girls in the nunnery are titled ladies and their families have a great deal of power and influence at their disposal. And so we have what the publicity blurb calls a harrowing drama of lust and greed, the lust being illustrated by nuns in bed with various chaps and more nuns taking other nuns' stockings off. It's nicely photographed and pretty to look at, and I suppose it was designed as a sequel to The Nun of Monza, in which Miss Haywood played an equally wicked nun of an earlier period. But it's not played with a lot of conviction, and at times we seem to be watching not so much a harrowing drama of greed and lust as a rather dirty campaign for the presidency of the local WI. Here, though, is the moment in which Miss Haywood's noble supporter lays it on the line, by telling her what, or rather whom, he wants in return for his help. Mother Lavinia is ill. She's sorry she can't greet you personally. Is dear Lavinia's health becoming any worse? Her condition is certainly not improving. Well, I don't think we should dispatch her to heaven before her time. According to the Vatican, an invalid may not be appointed Mother's Superior. You're free to move. Thank you. I must also thank you for the gifts, especially the medicine, the elixir. It was very kind of you, Don Carlos. And Isabella, how is she? My niece is very well. Have you checked her? Of course. Everything all right? She is exactly as she was born. Hmm. We uh, saved her from that young scoundrel just in time. Don Carlos. Reverend Mother. Are the documents all in order? Hmm. They are. When it's a question of increasing their land holdings, the church never says no. Your appointment is all but assured. I could say, as sure as Isabella's virginity. Once you become Mother Superior, there will be nothing to prevent you from sending her to me. I will move into my villa at Bayano and wait for her there. It's not far from here. I hope I won't have to wait long. Boff is a delightful and thoroughly anarchic comedy by Claude Feraldo, the director of Temrock. It's the story of a revolution among a working-class family which casually and quite gently turns all notions of middle-class morality on their head. The father, Paul Crochet, murders his sad, dreary wife, throws up his job because he's bored sick with clocking in and clocking off, and moves in with his son and daughter-in-law. But he has this little problem. He's still a fairly young and virile man, and every now and then he'd rather like a girl to a cuddle. So he says, why not keep it in the family? Why can't his daughter-in-law do him the occasional favour, purely as a friend, of course? And to this she agrees with placid good humour. Well, later on, while Monsieur Crochet is out for a walk, he encounters a pretty shoplifter, played by Marie-Hélène Breillat.
Muito, muito diferença. Não tá difícil. Tá difícil. Tá difícil. Monsieur Crochet takes the girl home to complete an interesting menage à quatre, and in the end the son gives up his job too, and with his father, wife, the shoplifter and a black street sweeper, sets off for a life of indolence in the south of France. Everything in the film happens so naturally and so amusingly that it's not until it's all over that you realise how many of our conventions have been shattered. The sanctity of life, family and property are all ruthlessly destroyed. It's a picture that deserves to be seen, enjoyed and thought about. And now a programme of student films at the London Polytechnic. They tend to be a little derivative, but largely they're enjoyable and technically competent. In the present state of the film industry, I can't help wondering what's going to happen to all these fledgling directors when they're cast out onto the market. But still, putting such gloomy thoughts aside, let's have a look at one of the best of the student efforts, Tommy Gravedigger, which was made by Robert Haynes. It's an affectionate little picture about the reminiscences of a, of a Welsh gravedigger as he contemplates retirement after a lifetime spent interring 7,000 corpses. First day I made my drink, it was nine years of age. And it was in Cavern Brewery when I went to fetch balm for my mother from this very place where I am standing now in front of this tomb. They were the brewers, now, you know, and I was only nine years of age and I got really drunk on that particular Saturday. <coughs> and I don't know which way I got home. Standing by an hour, Looking at the grave of one of my best friends, he was fatally in, injured underground. One of the finest chaps I God ever put breath in. As the verse to say, a beautiful life came to a sudden end. He lived as he died, everyone's friend. And every friend, one's friend will be until we, we will depart ourselves. Over there, my beautiful wife lies. She's been there now for 23 years. Under the tree, and I think she's in a wonderful spot where the tree stops all the rain falling on the grave. And undoubtedly, in due course, I'll be lying there myself in the near future, and I think that'll be the end of Kevin's cemetery as far as I'm concerned. Lovely character. At this point, let's pay a brief tribute to another short film, Julian Chagrin's The Concert, an inventive piece of mime which won the Golden Bear Award for short films at the Berlin Festival last week. Here's Mr. Chagrin in mid-concert playing a piano solo on a zebra crossing. Incidentally, the concert is on view with Alvin Purple at the London Pavilion. This year's Cannes Festival Grand Prix winner, The Conversation, which is about bugging, wiretapping and professional eavesdropping generally, opens this week. It was produced and directed by the prolific Francis Ford Coppola, already famous as director of The Godfather, producer of American Graffiti, and more recently as writer of the screenplay of The Great Gatsby. In Cannes, he explained how he'd become interested in making The Conversation. 
I think uh, it started with a conversation, uh, ironically, uh, with Irvin Kirshner. We were talking about eavesdropping and bugging just as a conversation. And uh, he told me about some long-distance microphones that could overhear what people were saying. film like the conversation only was made because I made The Godfather. No one would let me make a film like that. That is not the kind of a film that seduces an audience. My film, which I don't consider a film about crime, I mean, the, the crime is a minor part, uh, is not an audience. Well, I shouldn't, they tell me not to say that, but really, in, in a way, it's not the kind of picture that panders to an audience. It's a very difficult film. The star of the conversation is Gene Hackman, who was the best bugging expert in the business, is mysteriously commissioned by a big business corporation to record the conversation of an attractive and charming young couple. But when he overhears the boy saying he'd kill us if he got the chance, Hackman makes the mistake of becoming involved in their lives. It's a film that moves slowly but builds up to an effective and unexpected climax and includes a very good performance indeed by Mr. Hackman as a loner, a man whose furtive and nefarious line of work has made him so suspicious and withdrawn as to be incapable of any human relationship. President Nixon's recent spot of bother obviously makes the story rather topical, but the conversation is not so much a comment on Watergate as on the ethics of a society that can produce and tolerate people like the character Hackman plays. The scene we're now about to see takes place after a convention of bugging experts in San Francisco, when some of Mr. Hackman's out-of-town colleagues have come back to his workshop for a party. Tell him about the time you put the bug in the parakeet. Parakeet? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he actually, Harry, one time actually put a microphone in a little parakeet. Is that right? <laughs> Parakeets don't happen to be my thing, Harry. But I sure would like to know how you did the team still open back in 68. What was that? Better, don't you get papers in Chicago, Millet? Probably out on strike. Yeah, it was all over the front pages. Harry was working for the Attorney General's office at the time. I didn't know I knew that, did you, Harry? Anyway, the president is Teamster Local back east, set up a phony welfare fund, right? I mean, you correct me on the details, Harry. I may be a little fuzzy on huh? There was only two people that seemed to know about it, the president and his accountant. They only talked about it on fishing trips that they went on. On a private boat. That was the only place they talked details. And that boat was bug-proof. I happen to know that for a fact, Harry. They wouldn't even strike up a conversation if there was another boat even on the horizon.